controversial point about of that there exists a surplus under socialism and the form it takes. Marx says that the form of surplus extraction is what basically defines an economic system. He says a specific economic form in which unpaid surplus labour is pumped out of direct producers determines the relationship of rulers and ruled as it grows directly out of production itself and, in turn, reacts upon it as a determining element. Upon this, however, is founded the entire formation of the economic community, which grows up out of the relations of production themselves, and therefore simultaneously its specific political form. This is an absolutely key passage in Capital to understanding any debates about the Soviet Union and whether the Soviet Union was state capitalist or socialist. But I'm first going to illustrate what's meant by this argument by looking at the form of surplus extraction under feudalism and capitalism. In the feudal system, the surplus was extracted as explicit visible labour that the peasants had to do in the fields of their lord might have to work three days a week for the Lord, two days a week, for, three days a week for themselves. This was distinct from the labour that the peasants did for their family, both in terms of the days of the week they did it and in the place they did it. They didn't do it on their own plots, they did it on the Lord's plot. The extraction take, took the form of personal domination and servitude. They were serfs under a lord to whom they owed duties. These duties are masked by reciprocity. The ideological system of the time made it seem that these were labour done in return for protection if they were on the land of a, a lay prince or lay duke. If they are on church land it was labour done in return for the blessings of the church and the life hereafter. The important point here is that the necessary labour was non-monetary. The necessary labour, that is to say, the labour they did to keep themselves alive, was non-monetary. It was labour they did on their own plots to keep themselves alive. Contrast that with surplus under capitalism. In the capitalist system, the surplus takes the form of surplus value, which is made evident when the product is sold. The extraction is hidden much more effectively than it is under feudalism, since the surplus labour is not geographically and temporally distinct. You can't say, at two o'clock in the afternoon, I was shifted to producing surplus labour. It's not visibly different. The exploitation relationship is still disguised under reciprocity. It appears that labour is being paid for the whole day, not just part of the day. So it appears as an exchange of equivalents. And it's regulated in this case by private contract between people who are formally equal, either the worker and a personal employer, or the worker and the abstract legal personality that is a firm. And here, necessary labour has the form of the money wage. It has a, it's quantitatively in the form of money because the workers are no longer in a position to produce their own food. They depend on the market for food. Now, how is the surplus regulated? In the feudal case, it's regulated by explicit feudal obligations laid down by custom or law. Uh, it will still be affected by struggles, and these struggles will, under the feudal system, will characteristically take the form of struggles over the level of rent. Objectively, it was constrained by the availability of the working population. If there was a large population of peasants, they could be exploited more effectively. And it was also affected by the degree to which the peasants were a military resource. If they were in a frontier region, for instance, frontier regions of feudal Russia, 
the peasants might be given laxer exploitation conditions because they were needed for defence. In the capitalist case, the surplus regulation is implicit. It arises as an emergent effect of a multitude of private contracts. Objectively, it's regulated by the length of the working day and by a hidden effect of the rising of labour productivity in sector two, the consumer goods sector. Marx identifies this as the critical form of late capitalist surplus, what he calls relative surplus value. Ra rising labour productivity in the production of consumer goods means that the necessary labour time is reduced. It's important to recognise that this need not actually take place in capitalist firms. In the European Economic Community from the 1960s onwards, the improvement in the efficiency of, for example, French agriculture, which was largely peasant agriculture, meant that less labour was required to produce food in France and therefore relative surplus value rose without it having to be done under explicitly capitalist relations of production. The surplus is also regulated by collective bargaining over wages and by competition in the labour market. The sort of generally rising level of exploitation we've seen these last 30 years is due to the excess supply of labour in the world market. Now what about socialism? I've been talking about feudalism and capitalism. Is there a surplus under socialism? Yes, there is, and there's a distinct socialist form of surplus. The surplus product in a socialist economy is defined by the planned net output ratio of consumer goods to capital goods. And this in turn defines a planned ratio of the workforce producing consumer items to non-consumer items. So it's this division of the workforce which is set out before the event in the plan that determines what is surplus and what is not surplus. If people are producing capital goods, they're not producing consumer goods. So if labour is allocated to producing capital goods, labour is not allocated to producing consumer goods and that affects the surplus ratio. Next point is that it's determined that the level of society as a whole. It doesn't arise out of private contracts. And the next point is that the surplus doesn't go as personal consumption by an owning class. It's appropriated by society as a whole. There are consequences of this mode of surplus extraction. Because it's determined at the societal level, it means that in socialist economies, the political level is dominant. The state appears predominant over the economy. There is no autonomous civil society that there is in a capitalist economy. The fact that the surplus isn't consumed by an owning class means that socialist economies can carry out a more rapid accumulation of the means of production than is possible under feudal or capitalist modes of extraction. Other consequences are, because the surplus doesn't arise from private contract, money wages are relatively unimportant in determining the level of surplus. What actually matters is the availability of consumption goods. And the availability of consumption goods is determined by the planned allocation of labour. The money wage also significantly underestimates necessary labour time, since so many goods and services are either provided free or are heavily subsidised. So the money wage is not a rel a, an, Im an important instrument or indicator of the level of surplus. From this it implies that in a socialist economy, 
trade unions cannot have a role in regulating the level of surplus as they do in, in, under capitalism. Winning wage increases has no general impact on working class consumption levels, since the planned level of consumer goods output doesn't change if money wages rise. Things can only be brought about by political decisions which affect the structure of the plan. From this standpoint, you can compare the historic USSR with contemporary China. You can't say that historic USSR was state capitalist because it was a distinctly non-capitalist form of surplus extraction. For contemporary China, where the overall allocation of consumption is still determined by the market, it would be realistic to say that it's a mixed state capitalist and private capitalist economy. In China, the capitalist mode of surplus extraction operates. Though, because many industries are state-owned, this somewhat reduces the unproductive expenditure by an owning class and allows a rapid rate of accumulation. Now, what about a communist economy? A communist economy would still have to have a surplus. It would need a surplus for accumulation of new means of production, and it would need a surplus to provide for the non-working sick and old. And the mode of surplus extraction would be the same as in the USSR, the planned allocation of labour between departments one and two in Marx's language. But there would be a need for democracy. Surplus extraction in the USSR could still be seen as alienated, since there's no explicit popular vote on the ratio between consumption and accumulation. But it is feasible to do this. You can express it in readily understandable terms, in terms of a vote on how much of each working day do you want allocated to supporting the old and the sick, how much of each working day do you want allocated to net accumulation of new means of production. And at the start of each plan, you could have a popular vote on the ratio of consumption to accumulation. That would give a non-alienated form of surplus extraction. 